For you stole Trevelyan's corn So the young might be the more Now a prison the Dáil Records show in 85, Burke lobbying severely hard about the tax deal, that we're not going to, we need to incentivise, we need to get them in, we have to kind of do what we can to get them in, all this kind of crap. One of his first jobs, there was a lot of changes in government at the time, but one of his first jobs was Minister for Energy, appointed by Hai. And one of the first things he did was, he completely gutted Keating's 1975 deal. He did away with the 50% uh, share in any way. He did away with the royalties. He brought in a whole lot of write-offs that the, an awful lot of stuff could be written off against profit on their tax. He left the 50% 50, 50 tax rate, because there's a psychological thing about that. But the other stuff, and the fundamental thing was, he, did, he smashed Keating's philosophy that Ireland would have half a share in any well automatic. Now, the, the Secretary General of his department at the time, a guy called Joe Holloway, told him before he made that deal, he, Burke didn't want any officials with him when he went in to meet Marathon and Enterprise people. And Holloway said, you can't do that without advisors. Burke did it. And that has come out. Holloway hung, around, hung on for another two years, couldn't stick it no more, and took early retirement. Another man called John Lockery, I think that's his name, took over. And there was a different, uh, let's say, as I've been recorded here now, there was a different emphasis and a different focus, right? Put it that way. The advice was then, in 1992, this is the current legislation, which has been amended by, by, by Eamon Ryan, but just tinkered with again lately. But the 1992 legislation brought the tax rate down to 25%, the lowest in the world, of the developed world, and brought in frontier licenses. And they're very important in this in this what we're seeing here. A frontier license, there's three types of license, frontier, deep water and standard. Frontier is a 16 year license. But with a bit of tinkering and a little bit of work, and it doesn't have to be major work at all, with four, with about four years can be added to that. So essentially 20 year licenses. That was 1992. A lot of them licenses were given out in the 1994 period. I think uh, Michael Lowry may have been energy minister at the time. A lot of these faces are turning up all the time, the same, the usual suspects. So licenses that were issued, I think the Carob license, I, mean, I can stand corrected, was issued around, either, it was one of the first licenses taken out after the 92 deal, or it may have been, a, was it, what year were it? It was applied for on the 1st of January 1993. Yeah, so it was one of the very first ones after, okay. So I mean, that was... It was, it was, that wasn't applied for till they got what they wanted, that long license. So, so from, from that date, from the, 16th, from the 1st of January 1993, add 20 years to that, straight away. Now, six years later is when they went to work on that, 19, sorry, no, 93 years later, 1996. That's when it was discovered. Um, the licenses, a spate of licenses were taken out. Uh, Enterprise Oil, the company I talked about, headed by John McGoldrick, a man who, 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 who hasn't really come to light but has been, has been fairly big behind the scenes in, in Bertie O'Hearn's fundraising group that was featured lately in the uh, programme about Bertie. It was this drunk Andre gang that, um, that had, uh, I suppose, a brief to raise funds. The party was into a fairly, fairly big debt. Savage debt, three million pounds. The country, of course, was, you know, terrible debt after Ahi had been in charge. A guy called Richardson, Des Richardson, was given the brief by uh, Bertie Hearn to raise money, clear the party debts. And he was set up in the Berkeley Court Hotel, took a top suite there. And one of the people on his team, but it hasn't really featured, it's mainly developer types, was John McGoldrick of Enterprise Oil a very close confidant of these fundraisers. And from their time in Ireland, from 84 to the time that they drilled in 93, the whole landscape and seascape had changed. The rules of the game had changed. Incrementally, the oil companies, with, with Enterprise Oil taken over from Marathon, led the charge where that they would effectively now become the owners of anything that's found in Irish waters. Keaton's philosophy completely wiped out. 
So there is a timetable, there is a scale in the FISRA report how that was done. But it's, I, work, I use the word incrementally. It's bit by bit by bit by bit. The control, the licenses they could sit on. The world average is three years for a license. But they 16 years plus all the way along the coast. You know, Enterprise got a huge amount of these licenses for a small company. It was allocated, and there's another map that shows there, there, but the older maps would show enterprise, enterprise, and enterprise in partnership with other companies, like Statoil, like Sega, like um, Marathon, different companies that have percentages of wells or total wells. Enterprise also had operations in Newfoundland, in the North Sea, Vietnam, Norway, all over the world. In 96, we'll roll forward. There's a lot of people here who can speak about that because they're in more detail. But in 96, we still managed to get Irish guys out of the race. We had big problems in our own union. And I'd say it straight out, it was corruption. And people we didn't trust were given the reins. Our numbers went right down. Some of us had been off, off the scene. And when we came back, we were appalled at the loss of jobs and the loss of, I suppose, clout that we had, and the loss of control of who was going out there and how this thing... We wanted to develop it way more than just jobs. We wanted to develop as an Irish offshore industry, the way that Scotland developed, the way that Norway developed. But of course, talking to the wall with any, any government official, talking to the wall with anyone with any... no forward vision at all. That we got a small number of jobs serviced out of fines. Galway, they knew they wouldn't get away with it. So they used fines, where our weak link was, to come up to service the operations in the current field. We had lads working on that rig, and I got a call on, on sat satellite phone there, Peter Carney, he's dead now, and he says that the rig nearly blew out of the water because the, 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 the valves on the seabed blow out preventer valves. They're about the size of a two-story house. They nearly couldn't withstand the pressure on that rig, the petroleum. Enterprise says we're holding, we're, we're stopping operations for technical reasons. It was nearly a disaster. That was 96. Prior to that, they had threatened to pull out of fines. Now, the one good thing that Emmett's dad did, Stag, Stag did, a man who doesn't get it, you know, a lot of the time, was he stopped them operating. Out, uh, he, he, they said, that, first of all, McGonick says he didn't want, prior to the Corrib, that he didn't want to hire any Union Irish guys. He was blocking the drilling company from hiring us. Even though we had long standing industrial relations agreements with a lot of the drilling companies. So he threatened to move to air in Scotland. And that'll be significant in a second. Um, Stag system, you can't claim Irish tax breaks operating on Scotland. This is meant to be an Irish economic, for the Irish economic area. This is the way, this is, this is what it's meant to be. He was putting the foot down on that one. So grudgingly, McGoldrick accepted, but there was problems in that rig from day one. But again, we had the line there. And once that, that was a 